you, Erica. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Not true to form, I'm actually organized today. <laughs> um, Facebook reminded me of something this morning that I knew was around this time of year, but I thought it was in April because the cherry trees are blooming. Um, seven years ago today, Willa and I read together with Joan Doby in Washington, D.C. <laughs> at um, a conference, or yeah, a conference, Split This Rock, um, a poetry con festival, they call it, a biannual event that explores and celebrates the many ways poetry can act as an agent for change. Reaching across differences, considering personal and social responsibility, asserting the centrality of the right to free speech, bearing witness to the diversity and complexity of human experience through language, imagining a better world. And uh, Willa and I and Joan and a number of other people were there to read from an anthology that Joan and her niece, Grace Beeler, had compiled um, titled, Before There Is Nowhere to Stand, P Palestine, Israel, <coughs> Poets Respond to the Struggle. And uh, it was a beautiful anthology. I wish Joan were here. I, was, I tried calling her, but too late to ask her to bring some copies for you to see. It's a very powerful anthology, and I was grateful to be part of it. Will is part of it. Sabina over here is part of it. Um, many poets. And um, so we were part of a reading from that anthology seven years ago today, and here we are reading together again. So it's wonderful serendipity. Um, the, the festival, by the way, takes its name from a poem by Langston Hughes. Don't you hear this hammer ring? I'm gonna split this rock and split it wide. When I split this rock, stand by my side. So I, I really like that poem, I like the whole concept. And so I'm going to open this reading with a fairly recent poem um, that I wrote in response to things, things that are happening today. I have several new poems I'm gonna be reading. And this one I wrote last November when I was fortunate enough to return to a place that my husband Ralph and I used to go to many times for, um, it's a place that we go to write, we want to write, and I would go to snorkel, and it's a place that opens me up. It's a place uh, that feels um, safe in a way. Uh, all the everyday distractions of wonderful Eugene my home are gone, and all of a sudden the inner things start to emerge, as well as concerns, and this is a poem of concern. Um, and the title has the word grouper in it, not to be confused with groupie. Uh, grouper is the name of a fish, and it's on the menus everywhere in the Caribbean areas, as, in, as well as other places. It's, if you look it up, it's on the endangered list in many different places. There are many varieties of grouper and a number of them are endangered. And this poem is titled, If on the Menu Grouper Didn't Appear, or when it did, the words of warning facing extinction were right next to the price. If tourists could look past the lure of exotic and grouper were not so tasty, flaky, firm, and almost no bones. If pesos didn't revolve around grouper, nor lives of cooks and waiters with families of six in one room. If the fiction of plentiful didn't slide with such ease from tongues, if anyone dared to question. If grouper never made courtship sounds and didn't gather each year from hundreds of miles around, if undersea microphones were never designed to eavesdrop for days on end to the world's largest dance of the most intricate pairing of spotted, slowly changing reds and browns, circling, spiraling, swirling, and coupling, 
if overfishing at sites of mining did not threaten, if overfishing meant breaking a law and the penalties harsh, if beauty and wonder could put food on the table, if conscience could shelter each head, if in our fragmented minds opposing realities never dangled, like these sentences, like the future of our world, if the lures of hope were never got some nice help from my writing group. Thanks, guys. Um, this is one that I wrote several years ago. It was published recently in The Poeming Pigeon. Uh, it could have been written just a month or two ago. And I really love your applause. You might want to hold it until the end. Thanks. The night the waters rose, in the hurricane's wake, half a continent away. The smallest spider, eyelash thin, albino white, found its way into my dry kitchen sink. And as I woke to news of the highest ever watermark already crested, and as makeshift shelters and stadiums filled, that smallest of spiders struggled against the sides of my dry kitchen sink, which would not stay dry much longer. And as those whose denial and oversight had been the cause deftly vanished into the maze of their own empty expressions, as those in charge of rescue competed in passing the blame, and we, in the comfort of our rhetoric, watched from safety the rise of sewage mingling with seawater, fresh water, with what used to be cats and magnolia petals and faith. I gently lowered a tissue onto the floor of my empty sink. That smallest of spiders climbed onto it, trusting, and gently I carried tissue and spider out the kitchen door into the crimson impatience and left them there. <coughs> All of us voted our hearts. <coughs> These are kind of protest poems in a way. Um, I'm wanting to stay close to that split this rock theme. And then I'm going to veer sharply away from it in just a moment and give you something maybe to laugh at. Um, this one emerged after a class I was taking at Willamette Lane turned kind of ugly one day. And I was left wondering, what do I do now? All of us voted our hearts but one of us only, out of our small, close class, was on the side that elected him. Yours, the one heart trusting that brash, vain, glorious man with the world. All day it's been on my mind, driving alone along a seascape that once, years ago, brought me close to tears with its beauty, my mind now replaying yesterday's scene, the way you quietly listen to the rest of us get carried off course by waves of our own fear and dismay at how fast every single thing was falling apart. We couldn't stop trying to make sense of it all. Some of us sensing the reach of us, excuse me, none of us sensing the reach of our words until your eyes filled up, your face turned red, unexpected the way your words spewed fire. Facebook friends, you said, were unfriending you. Distant family hated you. Yes, I voted for him, you said. I'm hurting, you said. And we were stunned. All day as I drive, I've been trying to make sense of it. 
You, teacher, healer, whose hands all her life have lightened the loads of others who never would knowingly do anyone harm, who voted for someone whose orders in their sweeping blindness tried just last week to turn from our borders a four-month-old child on her way to life-saving surgery, a child whose family had trustingly trudged through all the legal steps. What now can I say to you, who yesterday felt only your own self harmed, whose face turned red, whose tears about to flow stopped me in my tracks? How do I offer compassion and still hold firm? This I wonder as I drive in early afternoon south along the coast towards home, glancing, disbelieving at the far horizon smoldering red, all that long narrow space that should be blue between the slate gray sea and low storm-filled clouds. Red, as though a trillion barrels of oil have spilled and spread, and a distant fire burns unquenchable all along the whole western edge of our world. Sometimes we need to lighten up. <laughs> um, and the next poem is going to be published in a journal of Dada literature and art called Mont, I can't speak French, Montemont? Montemont. Thank you. And the title is Tricky Dick. <laughs> and some of you might remember this guy. <laughs> um, we have another one in the White House um, that this particular fish reminded me of. Um, and there is a fish by the name of Slippery Dick, <laughs> which I discovered while snorkeling. And I could not resist, I mean, I just couldn't resist writing this poem. So um, it's a sonnet. I had to rein, in, rein myself in. I give myself a form to, to use, so it's a sonnet. Tricky Dick, we used to call our finally hooked president, Richard Nixon, whose lies passed muster far too long, and wit was what we called upon when faith and petitions, marches and evidence failed to stop his rise. Wit intended to fill the sails of our drooping spirits, to usher more than despair into ears ravaged by bluster that shipped thousands our age to early death. Today, snorkeling south of the border, taking a break from our planet, dying, more lying, and wars repeating, I learn that Slippery Dick's the name of the pouty-lipped fish I often see snaking just over sand. A rejected erection? <laughs> Friends, are your sails ready? I blow you this smile, ready-made. <laughs> And this one just came out of nowhere. And again, we've got some fish imagery here. Um, I was responding to a call for submissions to a poetry anthology about kissing. We'll see if it gets accepted. And the title is, When You're Caught in the Net of Ineptitude. When you're caught in the net of ineptitude, Kissed with a kiss that isn't the kiss you hope for. This is, by the way, from a memory that surfaced in response to this call for the poems, and all of a sudden I remember this kiss from way back, like maybe 55 or more years ago. Right? That's way back. But you remember these bad, I'm um, never mind. <laughs> these these uh, efforts. When you're caught in the net of ineptitude, kissed with a kiss that isn't the kiss you hoped for, lips unmoving as fish lined up on ice, eyes wide open and blankly staring, tempting, 
as chopped octopus tentacles whose very essence of intelligence has fled the scene. Chin, a pump handle, up and down, lips still frozen, chin up and down. Good God, you, you ho, ho have waited so long for this, watching him from afar. How can you say to him, no, no, this is not poetry. <laughs> but you right now don't want to be teacher, you want to be taught, or at least met halfway. Oh dear heartthrob, let's try to untangle. Give it one more try. Kiss me, sweet. <laughs> Again, my thanks to the poetry group. You helped me tweak it. To the world's champion whiner, that's W-H-I-N. I mean, she drank a lot too, but to the world's <laughs> champion whiner, some words from the artist's retreat, you couldn't wait to leave. This was a long time ago. It's not the same without you, my sweet. It's sheer joy. <laughs> not steering around your endless whining, your steady stream of mean grievances. Now we freely jubilate. Jungle heat that rumpled your feathers bathes us. It loves us, invites brave new insights into the bright complexity of work. We go berserk if kept from any longer by your venom, your threats of shutdown. No more the terrible countdown till your sweet departure. It was waiting for Santa all over again. <laughs> May your luggage, you dear destroyer, be filled with sand fleas, <laughs> hitching a ride to the living room floor. And may your ankles stay forever peppered with bites. <laughs> Would I, would that I not have to write such mean thoughts ever again, could say amen. Am I possibly of two minds in this? Ah, uh, you wish. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to need to wrap this up. Uh, I'm having too much fun. <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Martha and Erica and Joan for inviting me. Um, this is a great series, and I'm really honored to be part of it. Um, I'm going to end with a couple of shorter poems, but before I do, I'd like to make an announcement um, that on April 13th, uh, which is a Saturday, there's going to be a program um, sponsored by Surge standing, or not standing showing, up. showing up for racial justice. And Carter McKenzie is organizing this, and it's going to be a program in support of the Winneman Wintu tribe of Northern California. Some of you maybe have seen Shasta Lake. Well, Shasta Lake was formed by a dam which wiped out tribal sacred, sacred sites of the Winnem and Wintu uh, people. And now the government or someone's planning to raise that dam by 14 feet, 18 and a half feet, which is going to wipe out the rest of the sacred sites and also endanger the salmon, the sacred salmon. So there's gonna be a benefit program on April 13th at the Central Presbyterian Church uh, at seven, five to seven p.m in support of the Winneman Wintu people. I'm going to be reading some poems that I wrote while living in Norway um, about the sacred lands of the Sami people. And in fact, by happy coincidence, two of my really good, or three people are coming, two are speaking, two good friends from what we used to call Lapland, above the Arctic Circle where Ralph and I spent a summer while he was translating the work of Niels Auslach Valkypa. Um, Harald uh, Gosky and his daughter Siri, who's now grown up, she was 11 when we met her, and now she's working for the National Library of Trump, so cataloging all the Siri uh, material, uh, Siri, all the Sami materials that come into the National Library. Um, and Harold and Siri are just going to be in town that weekend with, with Harold's wife, Britt, and, and Harold and, and Siri are going to be speaking in solidarity 
as Sami people, white Indians of the north, they're called, with the Winnemann Wintu tribes. That's April 13th. Um, real briefly, I also want to announce this magazine, Yes, which uh, some of you may know, and if you don't know it, please look at it. It is printed on totally recycled paper. Uh, it's not slick paper, it has no advertising, and every story in here is something positive that's happening in the world. And I was just uh, re reading an online um, article from Yes Magazine, and I'm going to conclude with this very short poem. The um, article that was online this week was that there's a new board game that's been invented, which um, it, it fosters among its players a sense of cooperation rather than competition, and uh, rather than somebody winning at the expense of someone else. And I read that article, I thought, I think I might get one of those for my family, and then I remembered this poem that I wrote many years ago, and then I found it again and tweaked it. It's written um, when my granddaughter was two and a half years old, and now she's almost 16. And then I'll turn this over to Willa. Board game with Gemma. Two and a half, she's playing her first board game ever. Shoots and ladders. Has mastered spinning the dial and taking turns, letting her mother exclaim, I have a five. Watching her mother hop, hop, hop the red-suited bunny, small as a bracelet's charm, into the lead. Me too, a five, her father chips in. Six, grandfather springs ahead of them all. And then it's Gemma's turn. Such concentration in that index finger the size of a violet's stem. And when the needle stops, what is it, mommy? A one. Look, everybody, I have a one, a one, a one. 